Greetings from Shri Shankara Cancer Foundation. This December, we will be sharing awareness material about thyroid cancers. To talk about thyroid cancers and its management, we have Dr. H. K. Mohan, consultant nuclear medicine physician here with us today. Thyroid is uh, an endocrine gland. It is situated in the neck. So here on the screen you can see the thyroid gland right at the bottom of the neck there. It's like a butterfly shape. It may, um, weighs about 30 grams in weight. It's an endocrine gland. It produces a hormone called thyroxin and that controls uh, the metabolism in our body amongst other things. Uh, it is one of the largest endocrine glands um, and is one of the commonest cause of endocrine problems in people. Thyroid cancers are the cancers that arise from the thyroid cells, the cells within the thyroid gland. Now these fortunately are rare. However, amongst all the cancers that affect our endocrine glands, Thyroid cancers are the most common because it is one of the most treatable and curable cancers. Okay. This cancer affects women more than men, nearly three to four times uh, more in the female population compared to the men. It can affect young people or it can affect the older people. It is not something that is generally passed on from uh, you know, parents to the children, there is a very small subsect of these cancers which can be, but that is even more rare. Um, yes, I mean, <clears throat> most of the patients that we see uh, with thyroid cancer present with uh, an initial swelling in the neck and uh, obviously any swelling that comes on brings with it fears. Uh, thyroid lumps on the other hand most of them 90% plus are actually in fact non-cancerous. They are usually caused by in, in India uh, because of iodine deficiency. So what we call as multinodular goiter. It's a goiter that happens. Um, a small percentage, about 10% or even less, can be cancerous. So we need to reassure people here that not all uh, lumps are cancerous. But on the other hand, when they do notice a lump, it is very important that they seek medical help as soon as possible. Now, of these thyroid uh, cancers there are mainly three types broadly speaking what are called as differentiated thyroid cancers uh, undifferentiated thyroid cancers and medullary thyroid cancers and of these nearly 80 percent of these cancers are made up by the differentiated thyroid cancers there are papillary thyroid cancer and follicular thyroid cancer. Papillary constitutes about 85% of those and the rest of 15% by the follicular thyroid cancers. And these are the cancers that can be cured, treatable and can be cured. And because they form majority of thyroid cancers, as I said initially, thyroid cancers are very much a treatable and a curable condition. Once we confirm that the lump in the neck is a thyroid lump, <clears throat> the, we usually ask our patients to undergo further investigation with an ultrasound scan to characterize that lump further. And on the ultrasound scan, depending on the features, if there are worrying features, then we subject it to a needle test called as fine needle aspiration, FNA test. And on the FNA test, we get cells which our pathology colleagues can look at under the 
uh, slide under the microscope and then give us an idea whether the thyroid gland is affected by cancer or not. And once we confirm that it is a cancerous lump, then the mainstay of treatment is going to be surgery. So the thyroid gland will have to be removed and along with it probably some lymph nodes may come out okay and then that is subjected to again examination by our histopathology colleagues who can who will then say what is the kind of cancer what is the extent of it and whether the lymph nodes around have been involved or not so once uh, uh, the surgery is done and it has been confirmed that it is thyroid cancer and the type of cancer depending on the stage of it they then are subjected to further management if they are very small cancers which have been picked up at the very beginning then they may not need any further treatment but just simply follow up with uh, a blood test which is very specific to for thyroid cancer called as thyroglobulin in the blood levels in the blood so one can be followed up with these blood tests however if the cancer is not at an early stage and has been found to be at a slightly more advanced stage then the patients will need some extra treatment which would include radioactive iodine. Uh, nuclear medicine is uh, a branch of uh, medicine uh, which deals with using radioisotopes for the diagnosis and management of diseases. Now the moment you say radioisotopes and radioactivity people might just initial response I get when I meet people and say I'm a nuclear medicine physician is that oh wow but then the next question is what is it and when I say that it is using radioisotopes for diagnosis and management the next thing they say oh my god isn't that dangerous I actually would like to you know reassure our patients and public that nuclear medicine is using the radioactivity under stringent medical supervision. It is very safe and has been used for decades now in patients with varied you know, reasons, be it thyroid cancer, be it neuroendocrine tumors for treatment or for other kind of diagnostic modalities. So it is a very safe technique and there is no need for the public to be alarmed about it as long as it is done under strict medical supervision. As I had mentioned that um, patients who have got a slightly more advanced thyroid cancer will need extra treatment and with radioactive iodine. Now radioactive iodine is a byproduct of uh, uh, reactors um, and uh, we utilize the radioactivity in the iodine to for treatment of thyroid cancers. Now iodine is present in uh, <clears throat> various foods that we eat be it seafood or it could be in dairy milk uh, or it could be in various vegetables like the cabbage family, spinach, etc. Um, and it's of course uh, ubiquitously present in the iodized salt that we use. Now the iodine is taken up by the thyroid gland cell to make a, the thyroxine hormone and that is very important constituent of it. Now the same way after um, in a thyroid surgery when we are treating patients with radioactive iodine the radioactive iodine is picked up by the residual or remaining thyroid cancer cells to make thyroxine however because of the inherent property of radioactivity of this iodine that we're giving the radiation from it kills off the thyroid cells now the good thing 
is that it is only taken up and retained in the thyroid cells. In the rest of the body, however, it is cleared out by the kidneys in the urine. It's flushed out. So we always advise our patients to drink enough amounts of water. So you know, none of the uh, iodine that we give remains anywhere else in the body. And we are exactly or precisely attacking the thyroid cells and thyroid cancer cells and treating them. This is probably the first personalized medicine in medicine that we have seen. It was originally done since the 1930s and that was the very dawn of personalized medicine as we know. As I mentioned earlier, you know, radiation, radioactivity given under medical supervision is very safe to use and um, it should not be something that we should be worried about. Once the patients have been treated with radioactivity, we usually give them a set of instructions. So in this case, in patients who have had radioiodine treatment, we tell them, when they go back home, uh, they need the radiation for the treatment of their disease. However, some radiation comes out of them. It's emanating from them. So, when you or me are close to the patient, we are exposed to this radiation. Normally, when you go out into the sun, you are exposed to the various kinds of radiation that you get from the sun and other kinds of background radiation there. We are exposed to it day in day out. So we don't need any more radiation unnecessarily. Whilst if you are close to a patient who's had radioiodine treatment, you might be exposed to this radiation. It does not cause any ill effects suddenly. However, it is something that you don't need. So we always say, once the patients go back home, their near and dear ones should take care. We usually say for there and there are guidelines that would suggest that such patients should sleep separately for a period of time. And here we say at least about 10 to 12 days and they should sleep on their own. So nobody else should be allowed to share the room because that is probably the longest time when somebody would be close to such patients over a time of six to eight hours and that would lead to a lot of radiation exposure. So we say the patients have to sleep separately. However, it does not mean that the patients are in isolation and they're quarantined. Okay, they're not locked up in their house so they can meet people meet, greet, give a hug or a kiss to a child, whatever. But the important thing is limiting the amount of time that they spend with other people. So we say that amount of time where there is close contact and close contact we define by less than one meter apart. Okay, should be less than one hour in a day with people, particularly pregnant women and children. These are the ones who are, at, uh, who are the more sensitive for radiation effects. So we say avoid definitely close contact with children, pregnant women. But this is only for a period of 10 to 12 days. Again, if they wanted to go out for a walk, that's absolutely fine. But they should not stay in areas like public places like restaurants, cafes or in a um, place of worship, you know because they don't have control over who is going to come and be next to them. So we would generally say avoid such uh, uh, visiting such places for about two weeks after the treatment. Uh, but then after that, because the radiation has cleared out uh, from their body, they can get back into normal community living. The patients, uh, we would normally say and advise them um, to hydrate well. So they have to be carrying a bottle of water with them and sipping on it. They don't have to drink gallons of water, but they have to keep drinking it continuously, sipping it continuously to make sure that 
they are flushing out any excess radioiodine uh, in the urine that's not required and also to keep their saliva flowing because a little bit of radioiodine comes out in the saliva if the patient does not drink enough particularly over night time and we always kind of realize that we are very very thirsty at night and you're really dehydrated if they don't hydrate themselves well there is a chance that the a uh, little bit of radiation in the saliva might get stuck in the salivary gland causing a little bit of inflammation of the salivary gland so they may experience some pain and swelling of the salivary gland it is not uncommon but having said that it is very simple to treat first of all prevent by ensuring good hydration and if it does come up then pain relief in terms of painkillers and good hydration and a bit of hot fermentation is all they would need if it still persists they should seek medical help straight away okay now other um, side effects include because we are treating the thyroid gland they may expect a little bit of swelling in the neck region and where the thyroid was or is and that again as I mentioned can be countered with giving a little bit of uh, anti-inflammatory painkillers uh, lots of water right um, and general rest so I think this should take care of it however again there might be some cases where we might actually may need to give some anti um, you know, inflammatory drugs like steroids to help them but these are very rare conditions um, longer term there are not many side effects luckily from this treatment um, they are very safe to use um, there is always a fear with radioactivity will it cause another cancer in me particularly young people so I would like to reassure them it is absolutely safe um, I would generally encourage my patients you know if they want to look up on the web to get more information about their condition to look up standard websites um, like be it the Indian Thyroid Association the British Thyroid Association the European Thyroid Association or the American Thyroid Association they are the ones who give out the guidelines and they are the ones which give the correct information about their condition and may answer all their fears that may have okay logging on to many social fora might actually inc increase their anxiety so i would actively discourage them from doing that and speak to their uh, clinicians as to where to look for uh, if they need any further information okay um, now as I was saying, you know, people, young patients may be worried about cancers or second cancers in uh, once having been treated with radioactive um, medicine. Um, I would say no. Most of the uh, these second cancers that develop are anecdotal in literature, and you should also remember that we as a um, population these days living in the kind of current situation that we are are at a one in four risk of developing cancer at any given point of time so the direct association between radioiodine treatment uh, or any other radionuclide therapy to development of cancer has not been established okay uh, so rest assured um, that it is a very safe treatment as long as there is good monitoring and good follow-up of these patients by a specialist uh, clinician I think this would kind of cover some of the um, side effects that uh, one might face as a patient in terms of side effects for caregivers uh, as I mentioned there are no specific side effects that they may experience uh, because of being exposed to radiation 
Um, however, you know, as I said, you try and limit the amount of radiation that you are exposed to cumulatively over a period of time uh, to ensure that there are no other, you know, unwanted effects later on. Um, normally, you know, and there's been good studies that have looked at and shown that even when the carers have to give quite a bit of care to the patient, you know, when the patient is not as independent um, in doing their daily activities, even then, the amount of radioactivity that the care, uh, sorry, amount of radiation that the caregivers are actually exposed to uh, whilst helping the patient uh, is actually well within the uh, limits that are prescribed. Um, particularly if they follow the uh, instructions given by the clinician that is limit the amount of time that you are spending close with the patient and increase the distance as much as you can between the patient at least two meters plus then the amount of radiation you are exposing yourself to is very minimal. I mean that's an interesting question. Um, in fact, most of my patients, young patients, I actually reassure them. The treatment per se will not affect their fertility or the capacity to have children in future. We however do advise them that after the treatment, for about six months period, they have to ensure that they do not fall pregnant or father a child because this is just being ultra cautious in ensuring that if there is exposure of the egg or the sperm following radioactive treatment that has cleared off in the intervening six months period that we ask them to be um, you know to make sure that they don't either get pregnant or father a child apart from that their actual capacity to have children or father a child is not affected in any way and they can rest assured uh, you know be able to continue with that side of uh, their life or be it any other uh, aspects of their life that they may be worried about Thank you for asking me this question. Um, yes, um, we, as I said to you, uh, iodine is there in a lot of food that we eat. Now the highest quantity comes from seafood. Okay, so we say generally for patients who are undergoing radioiodine treatment prior to the treatment, at least 15 days prior to the treatment, to avoid eating any seafood. Okay that way the amount of cold iodine that would compete with the radioactive iodine that we give uh, would be reduced okay be it other um, foods that contain iodine like be it salt or you know cabbage lettuce or any other um, say diary for example they don't have to restrict themselves much i just tell them don't use extra salt in your food apart from the salt that you have already put in for, during cooking okay that's the main this thing rest of it is absolutely you know safe to use as i uh, initially when i started out i said say god forbid i had to have cancer it better be cathartic cancer because ed is very curable right most most of the times so radio iodine therapy has been uh, a cornerstone in the management of uh, thyroid cancers um, in these patients uh, very safe to use and has demonstrated time and again very effective uh, as an effective form of treatment a in terms of clearing and uh, ensuring the disease is uh, cured uh, and be 
in those patients who may have in whom the disease may have spread out and ensuring that the disease is well controlled and also taken uh, and reduced in the amount of burden disease burden so ensuring that the patient lives uh, longer uh, with a good quality of life so radioiodine has been uh, an excellent uh, and a simple but an excellent form of treatment in these patients the department of nuclear medicine at uh, shri shankara cancer hospital has been functional since 2014 uh, it is a department that provides the full breadth of nuclear medicine services be it diagnostic or be it therapeutic so we have a state of the art pet ct scanner with 128 slice ct scan and a time of flight uh, pet machine which can acquire images at very quick time and with lower doses of radiation to our patients um, we have gamma camera that can acquire uh, wonderful uh, images and gamma camera images uh, many of which come uh, are questions from our doctors um, be it you know like a bone scan um, be it a thyroid scan or could it, it could be a scan looking at the blood supply to the heart like as a myocardial perfusion scan so we provide the full breadth of uh, imaging services that uh, any nuclear medicine center in the world can provide um, as I mentioned we also provide the full breadth of therapy services be it therapy iodine therapy for thyroid benign as well as cancerous thyroid conditions uh, we also provide therapy for neuroendocrine tumors um, with particularly lutetium and more recently actinium um, we also uh, more recently have started treatment for prostate cancer patients with lutetium labeled psma and again as i said um, actinium the alpha therapy is also available for these patients uh, which is coming in big way uh, so uh, we have two dedicated wards for uh, therapy in our department with dedicated team looking after our patients uh, in our team we have uh, the front office staff who are always smiling and ready to greet and try and reduce the kind of anxiety that a patient comes to us with uh, you know prior to their scans uh, we try and give they they try and give the patients as much information as they can uh, in terms of being ready for the scan um, and then they are catered to by our nursing staff ensuring that all through their journey be it for treatment or for a scan that they're well taken care of um, and our technologists are experienced technologists who can deal with any kinds of issues that you know patients may have questions or may encounter during these uh, scans or treatment uh, days and you know um, as a team uh, the doctors are there part of the team to um, again support our staff uh, who are doing such wonderful uh, service and you know provide uh, the best care and uh, for our patients because patient is the center of an of our um, you know whatever we do and that's the motto of our department here at uh, Shri Shankara thank you so much for your time sir thank you